Mary, Mary Carroll is a Houston native, raised in Galveston Bay. She has a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a Master of Architecture from the University of Houston and enjoys bringing both of those disciplines together. Um, she worked as a stormwater wetland specialist for Texas A&M, as well as TCWP freshwater wetland restoration programs at landscape design and landscape architecture. She is the owner, founder and owner of Green Star Wetland Plant Farm, a growing company offering locally sourced native wetlands in settings. Before founding her own company, Mary Carol Edwards had led projects such as Exploration Green and Clear Lake in several wetland gardens in MD Anderson. Her her designs at Exploration Green, especially at Phase One East End, is one of the most prettiest and pleasing landscape designs in Exploration Green. Um, her heights, colors make it an arresting view. So if you haven't paid any attention to that end of Phase One all year long, it's beautiful. Um, Mary Carroll founded Green Star Wetlands in 2018 to meet a need for native aquatic species for all kinds of projects from backyard rain gardens to large acreage restorations. Mary Carroll, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Bev, uh, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak to the chapter again. Um, it's really nice to see some familiar faces and some familiar names too. So I'm glad to be talking about one of my favorite things to you, um, planting and establishing wetland or aquatic landscapes. Okay, so we'll be talking about using plants that grow in at different speeds to our advantage to um, appropriately establish a wetland or pond, bog garden, bioswale, anything that uses these kinds of plants. All right, this is a few pictures of a project that made me feel like um, this was a topic that probably needed to be discussed and um, um, put out in a wider sense. It's a stormwater basin at MD Anderson. Um, it's near the Proton Therapy Center and it was planted by another group um, maybe two years ago now. And um, the plants that went in were um, wonderful varieties of native wetland plants. However, they were um, largely ones that don't grow in very fast. They do, if given enough time, become large swaths of, um, of you know, the same species. But the timing is important because if a plant, if a, if a wetland has too much bare ground for too long, something is going to find its way in. And chances are it's going to be something from this rogues gallery of invasives, including basy grass or torpedo grass or deep rooted sedge. And uh, these are really undesirable in a stormwater wetland or any kind of aquatic landscape. I was concerned about this wetland, which we were contracted to take care of, I felt like we really needed to put some other species in that would cover this ground immediately and be able to um, uh, hold space against the invasives. So here you have a picture of us planting in February. Um, you can see there's a lot of space in between the plants that we're putting in and the plants that were already um, uh, planted in that location. And then again, what is this, um, six months later, this back here in the, on the left side is uh, the same area. It's kind of a little bit of a higher shelf in the wetland. And you can see it's got some good coverage now. It's kind of the same area right there. On the other side of this lady here is um, the slopes which were seeded with wildflowers. And um, that was done by other people, but it did contain some torpedo grass in it. One of those noxious weeds that I just mentioned. So uh, the torpedo grass would have found its way into this wetland here if it hadn't been number one maintained and number two planted with species that would rapidly cover the ground and uh, establish a native wetland community in that area. So uh, to answer the question, why does speed matter? 
quick colonization like you see here in this uh, photograph is your first line of protection against invasive species. Um, you'll still need to do maintenance, but it makes a difference between spot treatment of invasives and um, just a monoculture of invasives. Another reason speed matters is because of budget. Um, you kind of get more bang for your buck from a species that grows faster. Conversely, there are species, there are settings where you would want um, species that have a smaller footprint, take their time to grow in, um, get established rapidly, but take their time filling out and growing a larger specimen per square foot. So we'll look at um, some of these species <clears throat> that do well in each setting and we'll talk about why you might want to use them. Okay, so um, the first group of species I'm going to talk about are ones that I will call fast fillers. These are ones that will, once planted, make large swaths of themselves like you see here, the different species that have different textures and colors here, really quite a beautiful arrangement and um, They've done it themselves. They, they were allowed to grow in and uh, they were planted on a large enough scale. They have filled in really well. You see a few other plants in here, but not a lot of invasives. The first set I'll talk about are ones that are fast growers, but they're also very low. They, they're only about knee height. So there's some settings where you want lower plants um, frog fruit is an excellent example of that. It works like a ground cover. Here's a close up. Um, this is very popular with all kinds of skippers and um, lots of pollinators, even though it's really quite small. So this flower is probably smaller than my pinky nail. It grows with these uh, tangle of stems like this. And each time a uh, node develops on the stem, it roots down. So the result is like this in the picture here you see with the, the um, rambling growth. These grasses here, um, Gulf cord grass, are the same age as this frog fruit. They were planted at the same time. So you can really see the, the growth habits differing. This frog fruit, which probably was a small sprig, um, has really colonized the space here. That's really an advantage with a new wetland like this. This was at Exploration Green, which was just mentioned, and I really second Bev's comments about going to, to see it. It's a, it's a really wonderful place to walk, wonderful place to experience wildlife and uh, really not very far from y'all. Another fast and low species is sand spike rush. Um, spike rush or the um, Iliacris genus has many examples in it. In fact, in this picture, we're looking at two uh, different kinds of spike rush. There's the more clumpy one here that's the dark green, that's a mountain spike rush. And uh, I didn't include it in the, uh, the slow growing set for, that we'll see further on, but it would be appropriate because it, it clumps and um, it, it doesn't do a whole lot of spreading. Um, occasionally by seed, you'll see new younger plants growing up but it doesn't grow like this sand, sand spike rush, which is a very fine texture. It sends out lots and lots of runners. You may even find it in your yard sometimes. It's a great colonizer also. So here you can see it's kind of made almost a, a meadow or lawn of itself and um, is quite beautiful. Another fast and low is water clover. Now this is one you kind of need to keep an eye on. It has a uh, four leaf clover kind of shape, but it's actually a fern. So this is, this is kind of cool. And um, it's very attractive to people. I know people who um, have taken a small clump because they wanted to put it in a small water body and then regretted it because you really can't turn your back on it. The way that it's growing here at the Austin Botanical Garden, this is, this is the, a different species of, um, Marsalea, uh, it's the hairy one, let's put it that way. But it does recommend, it, it, it references how um, the water clover that we see most often here, Macropoda, will grow. It can make a really nice ground cover of itself like that. So it's something that you want to put in an area that you, you wouldn't regret putting it in. Let's put it that way. 
a wonderful, beautiful space like this, for example. Another of the fast and low plants would be um, Southern cutgrass or Lyrzea hexandra. You've probably seen this driving down the roads, um, passing a ditch where there's a kind of a blue green, um, soft looking grass growing in the bottom. Um, that would probably be Lyrzea. It grows by long runners. Um, it's in the rice family, I think. I think it's maybe a cousin to rice. Uh, has uh, small um, blossoms like this in the summertime. And this is really easy to establish and then it can really take off. Now we're gonna look at another set of fast growing plants and it's the one I call team players. I call them team players because um, they will grow fast and establish their presence, but you can also put in slower growing plants and not have those muscled out. Um, so they, they coexist well with a variety of different wetland species. This one we're looking at here, the Delta duck potato, or some people call it duck potato or just Delta arrowhead, Sagittaria platyphylla is a kind of a soft stemmed plant that all the wildlife loves to eat. It's got a kind of a, I guess, a, a succulent, crunchy sort of rhizome that um, will spread and, and create new plants from the rhizomes, but it also drops a lot of seed, which is, that's a good strategy for a plant that everybody loves to eat. I don't know if humans can eat it, but fish and birds and nutria, all kinds of wildlife will eat these. They're a great plant to quickly get established in the summertime. And um, when they're eaten, they come back from seed. So in each of these cases, I'm going to show kind of a close up, and I'm sorry, the resolution's not so good on this right here. And then a kind of a picture that shows something about how it would grow in a landscape, demonstrating a little bit more about the growth habit. We'll look at several arrowhead species, but this is one of the ones that doesn't actually have an arrowhead shape. It does have the three, three petaled flower, which is characteristic of its genus. Here's another spike rush. You know, we were talking about the sand spike rush before. It has a very different look uh, at the stem. It's quite of a pickup stick arrangement here, but I, I hope you can see that it's got grooves. It has this kind of a square section like that when it's cut. And it has a really fine sort of texture, grows to about two feet tall, maybe a little bit taller. Uh, doesn't mind growing in standing water. And um, as you can see, it can make a large grouping. It's in this picture here, it's kind of interleaving here with maiden cane, which has uh, very similar um, cultural requirements. This one grows by very fine seeds and by um, roots that have little small tubers in them and runners as well. It's easy to get established. Since we mentioned maiden cane, I wanted to put a close up of that. This is also at Exploration Green. This is about, I think, year two. These fast team players, um, I should mention that the reason why I consider them especially fast is that they will begin to cover the ground by the end of one warm season. That's a good metric to know about the species because when you are um, establishing a wetland that you could say is a an engineered wetland. I was about to say a working wetlands, but all wetlands are working, right? So an engineered wetland, like a wastewater treatment wetland, um, stormwater treatment wetland, wetlands for erosion, large conservation projects. The measure of success is to have 70% coverage by the end of the year, by one year. And you can actually do better than that, but to, to reach that 70% coverage uh, threshold, um, you have to pick the species carefully. And so these fast species that I'm talking about now are the ones that we would pick to get a wetland really going jump started and successfully functioning as a high quality, quality wetland within the first year. So this is another reason why um, speed is important. 
And these species that we're looking at, you can use them in a smaller wetland setting, a pond, um, a tub of plants and a water feature, but you will need to containerize them and, and keep an eye on them too. By, by keep an eye on them, I mean prune things when they start to get a little too rambunctious, maybe cut things back, make sure that the, the container doesn't have holes that the plant is going to send runners out of or rhizomes out of and get itself established. Here's one that will do well in um, semi-shady conditions. It's not a whole lot to look at. In fact, this one I believe is blooming at these nodes here. It's not something that humans will get really excited about, but um, it has an important function in the ecosystem and it plays well with others. So here you see it's um, in a, a mixed setting with Lyrzia here in the corner. It's got the square stem spike rush. It's got some juncus and it's got some Chinese tallow too, but it is doing a good job of keeping out invasives at large. This is another one that grows um, easily by rhizomes. That seems to be a characteristic of these fast growing plants. The common three square, um, Shonoplectus pungens, has the section here that gives it the common, uh, the common name here. And it has a way of spreading out. Um, it, it can get thicker than this. This is um, right here. The picture with the iris is uh, at Sheldon Lakes, Lake State Park in a pond that wasn't very old, but it does have a nice habit of um, spreading out along the substrate under the water and putting a lot of roots out so it's good for erosion, it's good for establishing um, community. Um, and it's kind of a neat plant that just says wetland to me. Now we're going to look at some plants that I called um, fast and free. They need a lot of space. They, they don't like to be hindered. They, uh, they do best where they've got room to grow in or in a setting where it doesn't really matter how thick they get. These are not team players. They will crowd at everybody, including the natives. So um, use them judiciously. They're also great specimen plants, um, say in a pot, it could be quite beautiful in a pond. What we're looking at here are uh, examples of bulrush. There are several species that we use here. Um, the Shonoplectus californicus is the, the hard stem bulrush and it has a kind of a triangular shape. In, in these photos, I can't remember which was which. It also tends to be a little taller. And then the other species that we will um, encounter in our area frequently is um, Shonoplectus tabermontanae. You probably would prefer to know it as um, soft stem bulrush. You can see that they, they, um, they make pretty large clumps out here. It's not continuous. Um, they kind of find the topography that they like, but they are pretty big clumps. And that's great habitat for a lot of animals. In this picture over here, where you're looking at the stems um, growing in the water, there's also a lot of mosquito fern. So while we're talking about fast growing things, there, there are a lot of little things that will grow on the surface of the water, like I think this is uh, water meal, the green there, and then the, the mosquito fern, Azolo, with the kind of reddish little clumps there. Not all that desirable in many settings, but also a, a very fast growing thing. These bulrushes will grow in standing water that is deeper than almost other, any other species except the water lilies will tolerate. For that reason alone, they really should be considered um, as an important plant in, um, in our wetland building arsenal. Another fast and free to roam. A lot of people are familiar with cattail species. We have several that uh, you'll encounter on the coast. These two species that I, I'm showing pictures of, this actually might be another one, the typha angustifolia, the narrow leaf typha. Um, they hybridize. And often you'll find them in the same kinds of ponds. You'll see the, the different widths of leaves, the different forms and thicknesses of their, what do you call the corn on the cob type seed heads. They like a lot of space. 
So give them an acre, they won't cover the entire space because they will find the topography that they like. They, they kind of stay out of the open water if it stays deep enough, long enough. Um, they don't really like the dry. So they'll colonize that in between kind of state. And these are more plants that you want them in a place like a wastewater treatment plant where you, uh, wastewater treatment pond or polishing pond at a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so you get, just get a lot of plants taking up nutrients, but it may be more challenging in another setting. Here's another giant cut grass. It's not related to the uh, southern cut grass that we talked about earlier. It can go in as a sprig and then, uh, you know, within a few months, you've got this clump that's three feet across and five feet tall. And um, given a little bit more time, you'll have a wall of cut grass. Even the cattle chewing on it in the wintertime are not going to um, dampen its ardor to cover the world. So this is a great thing for erosion control, wildlife, but it helps if you have, a, you know, a lot of space for this. Okay, now we're going to talk about another kind of growth habit. These are the medium speed fillers, which until I started preparing for this talk, I didn't even really realize that was a category that needed to be addressed. But these are plants that are pretty fast in establishing themselves in a wetland, but they're not really going to spread until maybe the second year. So these are ones that probably don't have runners they um, will grow slowly from the center or quickly from the center. Like uh, you see this, this pickerel here and the back there is a bull tongue. We'll look at both of those more in, in um, depth. They'll drop seed, which will also help to um, propagate themselves, but they're not going to be as aggressive and dominating as some of the previous ones that we saw. So these are medium speed fillers. I think that a, a good setting for these is perhaps um, detention pond um, or stormwater pond in a neighborhood where you have an HOA that is concerned about appearances, is concerned about beauty, but it's also, um, it, it needs to function as a wetland. So these are plants that you could have established and then kind of keep an eye on as they grow. So let's have a look. White top sedge, again, we're going to start with the short species. So these are ones that are going to be knee high and below. Uh, this is a beautiful spreading plant. And when I say spreading, you, you may have heard of the adage first year sleep, second year creep, third year leap. Well, these are plants that are going to do sleep, creep, and leap, or they just might do creep and leap but they're not like the previous set, the really fast ones that are just leap from the get-go. So these guys, once they get established, will begin to find their way through the other species. And in the summertime, they show up with these wonderful blooms. The actual flowers are down there. And these bracts here are just kind of signals, signs to the insects. Come and check this out. More shorties. These are Bacopa. Um, we have two species, actually you have three species of Bacopa in this area, but one of them I, I, I don't see enough to be familiar with uh, how to use that as, well, it, it's less encountered, the rotundifolia, Bacopa rotundifolia. Um, we're looking at this um, smaller species here, Bacopa monieri. Actually, they're side by side in this middle picture. Coastal water hyssop, the monieri is on the left. It's got a smallish whitish short lavender bloom. And um, its cousin, the Bacopa, lemon Bacopa is on the right with that beautiful blue flower and larger leaves with a more of a kind of rosette way of growing. Of the two, the Bacopa monieri here on the left is the faster growing one. And they like similar water water uh, requirements, I guess you might say. Um, they're the one on the left, the 
water hyssop doesn't have a particular smell. The one on the right has this fantastic eucalyptus kind of smell, um, which is cool that way. And apparently they're both edible. Pickerel, this one will eventually make a pretty large kind of plant. And when planted shoulder to shoulder with others of its kind, it develops this swath here pretty rapidly. It takes more than one season though. This picture you're seeing here is at the Houston Botanic Garden, which is really marvelous to visit. And the plants that you're looking at here, we were fortunate to provide in October of last year. And so you can see that they've really grown in pretty well by now. So th this is a year in the ground. I'm not sure how closely they planted them, but you can't tell which is um, the original plant and which is the, the new growth. Um, it's one continuous swath. So that's what the plants will do in given about a year and a half. Or it's maybe better to think of it in terms of warm season. So a warm season and a half. Here's another arrowhead that doesn't have an arrowhead shaped leaf, um, but it's definitely in the same family. It holds its flowers up above the leaves. So that's uh, something that makes it uh, kind of statuesque, very desirable as a specimen plant. It will slowly grow larger from uh, wherever it's planted, but it does drop a lot of the seeds. Um, the seed heads here will mature and uh, crumble off the, the seed head and um, float to many places. So you can see in this picture here on the right, all those white flowers, there are bull tongues that have found their way along the shoreline. It wasn't planted there originally, it was in a different part of the pond, but within a, uh, two years, it's found its way over here and it's looking well established. More flowers on medium speed. Pond smartweed, is in the knotweed family. It's got little white flowers. It's got a kind of a um, vining sort of growth and it can really cover a lot of ground. Here it is again with the cut grass holding its own with the cut grass. It's another favorite of wildlife. There are a lot of birds that really love the seeds and apparently we can also eat it. I have not tried it myself. Um, so this is another one that's easy to establish. It can, you can cut a stem, put it in water and get roots off of that and keep planting more of it. Lizard tail is one of my favorites. Here we're looking at the Pinebrook wetlands um, in Clear Lake. Um, this is a fabulous planting of them there. Um, as you can see, they've had enough time to really grow in. There's not a lot of other stuff that's um, competing with them until you get to the, the growth of other plants over there. It's got a, a beautiful heart-shaped leaf that has a sort of a spicy scent when it's cut or when you're dividing it. Easily propagated. It likes muddy kind of conditions where it'll grow in garden soil, regular garden soil as well. Button bush. So I'm not talking a lot about trees, but if we were going to look at uh, fast growing trees in the wetlands, it, I, you know, I would consider black willow and Texas ash and one of the rattle pods, Sesbania drummondii, uh, quick colonizing plants. Generally, unless it's a, uh, a landscape setting, um, trees are discouraged in wetlands. But here you can see there's a wonderful specimen. As it grows, it will get maybe 10 feet tall at the most, but it will slowly begin to colonize. It will, it will um, send up other stems, which become trunks nearby. And the seeds are very viable. So the, the seeds which develop from these um, fragrant pom-poms crumble off and can show up just about anywhere. All oh, right, here's some uh, floating pads. Water lily type plants have a reputation for um, 
being fast growers and outgrowing their space quickly. Um, I find that actually in practice, they are more of the medium speed so that you may not even see them growing much the first year or the second year. And then um, you may get really astonishing growth after that. In this case of the Mexican water lily here or yellow water lily, this has been left to its own devices in a small pond for probably two years here. And then it had to be pulled out. It's a continual maintenance that needs to happen here, but it's just like mowing a lawn, you know, that's a continual maintenance too. So when you plant, it's just um, important to know what to expect about the plants that you're planting. They all exist in a community. Um, there's no isolated plants, even the ones that we consider a, a solitary special uh, specimen, I should say, are in relationship with other plants and animals. So they're all a community and it's just a, a matter of knowing what they're likely to do in, in any given setting, in any given community. So this marvelous plant here needs to be maintained, um, pulled out and divided and but the reward for the work is this blossom here. The spatter dock is um, similar in shape, but it's, uh, its flower never opens any more than this. So if you're waiting for this to open, you're gonna be, it's a long wait, you're gonna be disappointed, but it's got its own charm too. This is Exploration Green. I just have to point this out. If you hadn't seen already, there's a little gator. All right, now we're going to look at some green ones that are in that mid-speed category. Grasses are very important for um, wetland settings. We're also going to look at some rushes and some sedges too. Here's bushy blue stem. Right now it's kind of a golden color, but it's, it's bloomed recently. And this is what it looks like as it's dropping its seeds. A lot of these plants are going to be uh, several feet tall. Horsetail, this is another one where uh, you may know from a landscape that uh, you kind of have to keep an eye on this one. Ironically, it can be give, very hard to get it established, but then once it does, it has this sort of dense growth habit like this here. Shoreline sedge. Um, this is a one of the taller sedges, maybe three feet when it's grown. Um, here at Exploration Green, it took about two years, I think, for it to begin to fill in and kind of have this sort of blowing meadow look right where my cursor is. I'm circling a, a patch of, of the um, shoreline sedge right there. All right, finally, I'm going to talk about some of the slow fill plants. And I, I really have not exhausted all the species in each of the categories. I'm just kind of hitting the highlights. And I do hope if there are others that you um, are, have questions about their speed or um, you want to bring to our attention that there's something that should go into one of these categories, pl please feel free to bring that up in the questions. But a lot of things that we haven't talked about are in the slow category. So these are plants that could be good selections for small spaces. But we also need to know that um, as gorgeous as they are, they include a lot of plants with beautiful flowers. If you want to put a lot of those into the landscape, you're going to have to put them either very close together, which impacts the budget, or you'll have to intersperse them with some of the other plants we talked about, those fast team players, for example. Otherwise, uh, you just won't get the coverage. And so the plants that you don't want, those invasives are going to start to appear and you may not be able to see your beautiful slow fill plants at all. All right. Um, I just want to highlight one here, the switchgrass, which has a reputation for being fast, which is really not a very fast growing plant. It kind of stays in its place for a long time. In the summertime, uh, you'll begin to see these kind of beautiful airy seed heads and that um, lovely green color there. In the fall, it's another period that this plant is intensely beautiful. 
this was Nash Prairie last month on a kind of a cloudy day. And um, you can still see it's got fall color, these, these golds and yellows in, in there. And <clears throat> this particular clump is large. Um, you know, it's as tall as I am pretty much and, um, and wide. And when I first visited Nash, Susan Conady told me that some of those clumps of switchgrass out there were probably hundreds of years old. They've, they've tended to grow in a big donut shape with the center opening out, kind of like an oak tree would, growing wider and wider from the center. So even though it may be a really big patch, it is like, a, like many of these plants, um, it's been growing for a long time. That's why it's so big. So here's a gallery of other plants that I would consider much more gradual fillers. There's some favorites there. Um, the white water lily, if you give it enough time, it will fill up a pond, it will fill up a lake. It's, uh, I, I think when we see large um, bodies of water that have these plants, we have, we have um, you know, hundreds of specimens of say the spider lily over here, which I, I see is the Clear Lake mascot. When you see those and in, in understanding that they're really not very fast growing plants, you can really appreciate how long that they have been in a landscape. Knowing that, for example, the, the spider lily, maybe in a year it will put out two bulbs beside itself in a good year and then slowly begin to increase that way. When you see thousands ringing a prairie pothole, it's really impressive. You know that they've been there a long time. The same with the golf cord grass. You may see a meadow that is predominantly golf cord grass. It's a big plant, but it grows pretty slowly. So um, a lot of these here are wonderful things to go back and add to a wetland that maybe has been established with the, the team players or some of the shorter, faster plants. These are adding diversity. Um, so in just a few specimens, you can put those in and then they will mine their own propagation with seeds or um, bulbs reproducing themselves or, you know, slowly putting out rhizomes and growing larger. All right. Well, that um, brings us to the end. I look forward to any questions that you have. Um, as I said, that's uh, that's not all the wetland plants we have out there, but I hope this gives you a good idea of how different kinds of wetland plants can be used in different settings to get a really wonderful landscape established. You, you can see my contact information there and I look forward to um, questions you may have after this talk as well. Um, I don't really have. Um... Any questions on chat at this very moment, but I wanted to ask another question. Um, when I was at the Houston Botanic, uh, I saw in the in the water feature right when you walk in the door um, at that coral, whatever, they had a water plant. Now, is that something that's not native to Texas and that's why you don't use it? Or is that is there any of that for us? Tell me again which plant it was. Pap it said papayas. Oh yes, the papyrus is a Mediterranean plant. We have and lots we have of um, things in the Cyperaceae family, that, but none that look exactly like that. So um, if you use it, it's a good idea to have it in a, a container in an enclosed space so that it doesn't end up getting away. It just looked very, I just really liked it. I liked the looks of it and I just wondered if it were possible, but thank you. I, I'm glad I know that now. Yeah, we've provided some of the plants for that fountain. And um, one of them is um, a, a thalia that is not native to this area. Anyway, it's, it's native um, to Georgia and some in Florida, east of the Mississippi. Um, it has a bright red stem and it's tall. So it's kind of attractive to, to people. Um, not native here, but they wanted to have it. It wasn't, it was in their plant list and I happen to know where to get it in Clear Lake City. <laughs> so <laughs> we propagated it for them. Yeah, you know, I have mixed feelings about that, but it's also in that uh, fountain. And so, um, 
is used to good effect there. Um, a question just came in. It said, uh, is there a list of official common names of wetland plants or wild plants of the United States for wildlife with matching scientific names? Where would you go for a source like that? I think I would uh, start with the Wildflower Center's database. Um, every plant seems to have a just a slew of common names and um, some of them are kind of goofy, some of them are confusing, some of them um, do make sense like the square stem spike rush. Uh, so for every plant that you can learn there might be um, two, three, four, five common names and maybe two scientific names because scientific names do change too. So um, I, I agree, it's a, it can be confusing to um, keep track of those names, uh, but the Wildflower Center is a good place to go to. And um, then um, there's lots of academic, more academic sources like the USDA agriculture um, website as well. Do wetland plants have to be wet continuously? Um, some do and some don't. And um, for that topic, I could refer you back to a talk I gave in uh, September, I think it was, to the symposium, to the, to the wildflower wildscapes um, workshop. Um, so I was talking about plants that are divided into um, groups by their water needs, the, the obligate, they really need standing water, the facultative, the ones that can use water if they can get it or they can tolerate drying out, um, the ones that are upland species too. So um, yes, and I went through the, the species that um, can tolerate either being really wet or really dry. It turns out those species are good for rain gardens, um, for bioswales and for other really useful functions like that. Um, you haven't spoken to uh, water. Is, are we to assume that most of this is fresh or brackish water? Yes, actually, um, uh, everything that I talked about is fresh water. Um, some of the species can take a little bit of, of, of salt, like the, um, the bull tongue and um, the spartina. Um, if we're talking about saltwater plants, there's oyster grass, which is another Spartina, which people use as their kind of the go-to for establishing um, saltwater wetlands, estuarine wetlands. And so that's the, 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 the um, fast and free species in the saltwater category. Deb, are you getting any questions on the website? Um, I don't have any from Facebook, but I do have a question and a comment. Um, I, I've actually um, gotten some ideas for my own yard from your talk, um, but I'm curious about the horsetail. I really love, I've seen it growing um, like on the Lone Star College campus and I love the way it looks um, and I'd love to use it in my own yard, but I'm curious is, can that one be grown in a container? Yes, and as a matter of fact, I would suggest in a yard setting that it would be grown in a container. Okay. Um, even if you use a steel edge, it'll find its way through and around, and then you'll start seeing it popping up in your vegetable garden and yeah. everywhere. The other yeah. side of the driveway, it's amazing. It's a survivor. It's been um, growing since um, before the dinosaurs, so. Uh, yeah, it intends to keep doing that forever. Wow. wow. Thank you. So you have a lot of compliments on the chat um, from a lot of people. And, and we really thank you for your time. Well, thank you, everybody, for your attention. I hope you find out that this is uh, really quite useful um, as you go forth and um, establish some aquatic plantings or volunteer in gardens. And, uh, okay. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Carol. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your wealth of knowledge.